Right, and just like that, it's gone 7.59, almost 8 o'clock, and I'm early again for the change, getting things right. Um, done a bit of prep work, and I'm good to go. Live streaming on two channels, we're on Facebook Live, on my page, Carol Charo, as well as TikTok. Well, we have TikTok is on as well, uh, while we conduct the interview, but... Um, we have some avid listeners on TikTok. Welcome to it. Uh, log on. It's what we do every weeknight, 8 o'clock. It's a late night report. Tonight's the political desk. Um, three nights in a row, we got some interesting guests. We educate you on politics. I get educated. We learn a bit more every day. Anita Padiachi, good evening from Greenwood Park. Pam Naira joins us. Yashmir Singh, Iqbal Gafur. Salam, salam, and welcome. Niri Naidu, our regular, regular. Uh, on the platform and uh, Mike Hanifasad also joining us. Mervyn Lawrence, not Martin Lawrence, says hello. Hi guys on TikTok, welcome to it. Uh, it's the political desk on a Monday night. Kritika Deeptarayan joins us from Peter Maritzburg and Lionel James says hello. Dolly Singh, hello Dolly. <coughs> all good, all good, all good. And uh, Battling with a bit of chest cold, heavy chest and uh, nose. Uh, but yeah, Avinash Anup, hello. Uh, welcome to it. Uh, if you are new to the platform, please say hello. And if you are new to the platform, please say hello. Where you're watching from? It will be great to know where our audience is watching from. Where in the world are you watching from? Wendy Swanel, wow, welcome, Wendy. Wendy was banned from Facebook. Uh, for whatever reason, um, and she, she's back online now. Uh, she was uh, a bit of depression because she couldn't watch KC live. And she was a bit of a depression mode there. Uh, but she's back online. So welcome, Wendy Swanal. Welcome, Alex Seth also joining us. Uh, who will be tuning today? So Yashvir Singh. Chiranjit Naidu says hello. Uh, today's show brought to you by... CK Smooth, as well as Desi Dating, the professional matchmaking service. Uh, the opening special, free membership. Free membership. Uh, you don't pay any membership fees. Uh, contact them on www.desidating.co.za. April, what happened to that? Oh, you were speaking with, on, I don't know what you worry about speaking with on Facebook. Uh, Middleburg and Pumalanga, welcome in the house, Avinash. So it's Monday night and it's the political guest. Tonight we have a guest, uh, Mr. Naren Ganesh. We'll talk about him. Tomorrow we're going to have the DA's Nicole Graham. <coughs> She's joining us on the platform. Wednesday, EFF is lined up. Whether we get the guy, right guy or not, I'm still not sure about that. Hopefully uh, <coughs> we'll get uh, <coughs> the EFF online. And Thursday night, by the way, Thursday night we are in conversation with uh, Shando Teron. Shando Teron, a, an attorney I met a few years back, who's become an advisor and attorney to me. And um, yeah, he's going to be talking about father's rights, father's rights. Now, in many cases, when there's a divorce, when there's a separation, the mother gets all the rights or the female gets all the rights and fathers are generally thrown to the dogs, no rights. However, Shando Teron will educate you on the rights of fathers. He's been championing the rights of fathers, and fathers do have rights, by the way. Uh, yeah, there we go. And of course, if you guys are listening to me every day, loving what I do, how many of you have actually subscribed to my channel for 79, 99, 80 rand? Let me hear. I'll, I'll, hold, I'll hold the channel now for uh, 30 seconds to one minute, and let me hear how many of you who are regular, regulars here uh, have subscribed for 79, 99 a month to bring you interesting guests like Mr. Naren Ganesh here. Take ACC 200 for chest, of course. I'm taking ACC 200 and I'm taking Viagra and all of that to boost my systems in every way possible. Uh, Kritika has got a hand up. She's a subscriber. She's one of the first subscribers. Let me hear. And Kritika, I think you should challenge them every day. The regular, regulars who are here, enjoying the content and whatever. But playing Dom when it comes to even uh, some sort of um, subscription to the channel, not that you have to subscribe. Uh, whatever. So let me hear. <coughs> Alex said, says, me, who's subscribing today? Let me hear. Uh, all these interviews are worth more than 79 19 And indeed, I think so, by the way, uh, the time and effort that goes into it. Um, you're not obligated to pay this. 
subscription fee, by the way, it's obviously helping me as an artist as well to grow and provide you with this sort of entertainment. Um, and there we go. The comments went uh, quite. Uh, Niran Dipnan says, you're charging 80 bucks. See, the dating app is free. Uh, Elias Suleiman says, not me. Yeah, Elias Suleiman is not contributing. Uh, anybody else want to say, come on, let's support Casey, says Kritika. You know, I haven't really been pushing my channel and pushing that uh, uh, thing, but I think it's about time I did. Um, Jasmine says, soon it will be me. Um, yeah, it's about time I did it as well and uh, push the agenda. Hell, man, I've been watching DJs play music. People are sending them stars and sending them money, bank accounts. But the moment I say $79.99, Ah, then there's a problem. I get upset when that guy tried to challenge you, boss. Uh, don't get upset when anyone challenges me. Um, true, I subscribe people. Yeah, where the dop says Camille. Uh, Camille Krishna, when you subscribe for $79.99 a month, then I'll provide the dop. How's that? Will subscribe as soon as my scammer refunds me, says Nini Naidu. Yeah, yeah. Whenever the subscription issue comes up, um, I know some people have genuine problems, but uh, you question yourself if you're watching the channel. Question yourself that you watch every day that I bring you this channel, that we inform you of stuff. We try to educate you. I try to educate you on the channel. And um, this is how I earn a living, by the way. You must put your bank account details. Yes, indeed. I must be like the DJs. Put my bank account details. Uh, justice for one cent, $79.99. You must, you must push strong your talented Bruce says Yashvir Singh. Well, Yashvir, are you going to... Uh, I would give you five times the amount if I could, Casey, but currently cannot do. Well, Wendy Swanell, 99% of the people on the channel seem like they cannot do. Uh, if you want to subscribe, click the supporter badge at the bottom there uh, or at the top of the page, whatever. And uh, yeah, let's see. So every day I'm going to, if you are a supporter, by the way, you'll have a supporter badge come up. Um, so uh, Casey, beers are cheap now. <clears throat> so my team has been saying to me, boss, why aren't you pushing the subscription? Uh, well, I'm going to try and do that now. And then if you watch every day and you're watching the channel and you think uh, I'm worthy of a subscription fee uh, to support me, then go for it. If you think I'm not, then don't watch for free. <coughs> not, that, not that I'm charging you to watch, but uh, you get the point. Uh, thank you guys on TikTok for tuning in. My guest is waiting backstage in the studio. He's going to come on and say, Casey, I'm sub subscribing for $79.99. One of the first things I'll do when I'm elected as a ward counselor I will subscribe to your channel. Petrol price is going up, not the dops. Uh, I've been scammed. Right. So, right. That's time to bring on our guests. I've rambled on enough for about seven minutes now in the program. You must make a beer called KC Lager. Well, when you subscribe, you see this thing. Um, Joseph Setusa even says it's worth it. Thank you very much, Joseph Setusa. Um, Kitty Deep Tarayan, who's your party, Casey? My party, somebody asked me who's my party. My party, she died a long time ago. She died about 10 years ago. Um, she died at the age of 90, 100, 100 years old she died. So that's the only party I had. I also had a Tata as well. And uh, Tata died before party. <coughs> right. Anyways, it's time to bring on our guest. Let's have another little discussion. Uh, he's waiting backstage. Stream and there we have him. We bring him on um, with his, um, shall we say, signature cap. Now, um, before I do anything else, no, no, let 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 into this. Welcome to the channel, Mr. Narend Ganesh. Thank you, Casey. Thank you for having me this evening, and good evening to all your viewers. Right. Firstly, thanks for that. I want what I want to ask you is in all your. Um, uh, clips or your photos, I see this cap that you wear. This, is there something about it or you wear caps or you wear that specific cap like how I wear hairdo? Is it your signature now? Yeah, the the value of the cap, if you read here, it's called Eye Heritage. It will be revealed very shortly, the significance of that. But it is a signature. You know, I don't have a red beret. I have a blue cap and I think that comes from uh, when I watched a contraceptive machine once and they had a caption, if the cap fits, wear it. So that's why I'm wearing it. <laughs> All right. So you don't have a red beret. I've got a, I've got a black beret. Uh, Karen Smith says, is he the single one? What you're, what you're talking about? 
Uh, you already got a comment for your cap. I love the cap. So we're going to hear about there is something behind the cap. Uh, what it's about. Oh, God, let me just find my stuff that I was busy uh, sorting out. Um, yeah, channel. I want to do that. Just get you guys over there. Right. Now, let, let, before we start, well, let's start with this. Uh, give us a brief introduction about yourself. Uh, by the way, I'm sure you watched the other channels before and your other guests here. Some of them you just ramble on. We, we give them the yard and they run with it. I think you would know a bit better than that. Um, we keep the answers short and sweet so we get a little bit more done. Uh, we will go through almost everything that we think we can go through. So you don't have to lead from one into the other. Uh, we will come to the promotion of yourself and all of that. So just a brief, um, even from my knowledge, I know a bit about you. Maybe just give us a short insight into Naren Ganesh. Well, uh, I am standing as an independent candidate, as you have uh, will introduce further on. Um, my involvement in politics and social activism, uh, you know, was all my life. I was quite an activist at university, um, and I played the little role that I might call it during the heydays of the struggle. I was a student at the University of the Western Cape and quite involved with the UDF at the time. Um, was arrested. Uh, we were locked up at Victor Foster. We learned later that that was the prison where they took Nelson Mandela to. We felt very chuffed that we uh, warmed the place for him, uh, on a lighter note. And uh, I was involved in community activity uh, activities in my area. I am currently the Civic, chairperson, Civic uh, Association Chairperson. And I have taken uh, on, you know, ministers taken on the president. I have laid formal criminal charges against uh, the municipality, man alone, uh, for the, against the DSW, the Devon Solid Waste for Fraud and Corruption, which has resulted in a major investigation that is taking place currently, headed by the SIU and Hawks. In fact, President Ramaphosa, I had to write an affidavit upon which he had to make a presidential uh, proclamation, which he did that led to the investigation. I have led uh, uh, filed charges, criminal charges in the Equality Court, which will be going to Corn Court eventually against Julius Malema for hate speech against or anti-Indian speech. And as you all know of late, I've laid charges against uh, Keshla Mgwengwe from Toyota, who had made racist remarks um, on Facebook. Now, the thing is, you know, with election time, you will find a lot of people, and this is the rhetoric and narrative that goes about that people come out and suddenly you see them at the election time. For those who know me and who have viewed uh, or know of me, you will know that I haven't um, stopped any form of activism at any time. I was uh, elected twice onto the Federal Council of the Democratic Alliance, which is the second highest uh, uh, well, decision maker. Let me just lead into that. Let me just lead into that. Uh, the, um, Naren, uh, Ganesh. Just so I, well, sorry, I should have highlighted. I wanted to know your history previous to all of this. What you were, where we, where you come from, and all of that. Um, but you are, you are saying to me now. Um, have you been in politics before? Well, I've been in politics virtually all my life. In, in, in little forms, whatever, if you can describe it as being in politics, but not in an official capacity, okay. except at party level. Right. So that's so, where I stand with that. If you just why, want a little to know about me, I come from a little town called, a little suburb called Duff's Road, north of Durban. It's where most of the Durbanites know where the ship and aeroplane house is. So most people would know that. Well, I wouldn't know that apparently people in the younger days when they were kids, the parents used to take them. But before my time, I was born after that. I went pretty late. Uh, I was only born in 1984. So I don't know which year you were born, but uh, yeah. Anyway, I heard about this. No, we close the airport now. The airport is closed. Is the area called Duff's Road or is the road called Duff's Road? It, it's a unique little place. It's called Duff's Road Township, which has seven roads in it. Each road has its own name. So is there a Duff's Road? So it's one of the... Yes, yes. No, there's no Duff's Road Road. There's Duff's Road, which contains seven roads. Unique. Also, Duff's Road... I, I see, I learned something new. I always thought 
Duff's Road that there was a Duff's Road. Maybe I'm just uh, the same. I don't know if others, but so Duff's Road is a, is, a, is an area. It's a it's a it's a, it's a, it's a place. Yes. Okay, yes. but it's doesn't have a place. But doesn't have a road called Duff's Road in Duff's Road. No, no. Okay, right. So I've I've learned. So I always thought Duff's Road was was a road. So uh, we learn every day. Um, somebody wants to know uh, why I'm wearing glasses and if I'm blind. I'm fucking blind, man. Piss off now. <laughs> That's why why I'm, Alex said to us, hi. Um, why now that you? Oh, by the way, do you? What ward is it? What ward uh, is it? What number? <clears throat> It's Ward 34, uh, which includes the areas of Oka, Red Hill, Effingham Heights, Greenwood Park, Seacow Lake, and Kenville. Just while you're on that uh, dust road scenario and you spoke about the ship house and the plane house, that houses were built years ago. Who are these Lani guys in those areas? Who are they? Do you know them? Actually, it's one of the pioneer families in dust road, the Ramzharis. They used to be uh, bus bodybuilders, very famous. Bus bodybuilders, and, yeah. yeah. And uh, there were two brothers, Duki and Hiralal. And Duki was the guy, the elder brother, who was responsible for actually uh, the architecture and uh, designing of the, both the houses, the aeroplane and the ship house. So it was a very, uh, it was a very talented man. In fact, engineers and, and, and architects from Natal University were quite astounded that a man without formal uh, education was able to do this, which is quite a uh, feather in his cap. Oh, you mean he wasn't a qualified architect, but he designed the, the, those houses? Yes, which is quite an interesting little story. Wow, those those stories need to be told. I like to tell those stories. Those stories need to be told. These are those are iconic houses from back in the day and still standing strong. So well done to them. Maybe. I'm sure they, I think they may be late now, but uh, nice to know the families are still there. And uh, yeah, indeed, iconic houses way before the time. Uh, do you, do you, do you, do you reside in Duff's Road? Is that your area where you live? Yes, I do. Okay. I do. And just to... uh, I've been born here. So this is my hometown. Uh, somebody is commenting, what 34 does not include Duff's Road. What does she mean by that? Is he, are you Ward 34? Well, yes. What, no, Duff's Road falls under Ward 39, but I'm standing for elections in Ward 39. I have a residence there as well uh, as a business resident. So, um, and as a candidate, you can stand in any ward as long as you have some form of residence there. Uh, I will okay, explain so me, that a little later. Yeah. So let me be clear. You live in you live in Ward 34. Yes. But you're standing for councillor in Ward 39. No, no, no. No, let me correct that. I live in Ward 39, but I'm standing in Ward 34. Okay. What, what, uh, sounds interesting. Why? So obviously, you, you justify it because you have a business in the in other in the other ward. There, but why? Why yeah. the ward? What's what, what's that? Look, uh, to be quite honest, my dad was the uh, was a councillor, elected councillor in the same ward, 34 uh, election prior to 2016. And uh, there was no problem with that. Uh, in fact, he was a Democratic Alliance councillor elected at that time in that ward. And uh, take, generally, you can stand in any ward that you want to, as long as you have some form of residence in that ward, either business or uh, uh, residential. So I have a business uh, residence there that uh, I use as my business place, and also uh, my formal residential places in Duff's Road as well. <coughs> so what 39 you have a business there? No, what 39 I live in. What 34 is the business. You live, sorry, I'm getting confused. What 39 is where you live in. Yeah. What 34 you have a business or a home there? Mm. No, I, yeah, I use it as a business premises because I also do labor consultancy. Okay, and mm -hmm. one thirty nine. What what area does one thirty nine fall under? It's area Duffs Road, Mount Moriah, Mount Royal, and part of Cormarshu as well. Okay, I want to ask this. This has piqued my interest now. Why would you not stand in an area where you live? Is that area fine? You don't think there, or you have a Better chance there, or you want to fix problems there in, in that area? Why, why, why is that in Ward 34? Um, 
Look, Ward 39 previously uh, included areas like Avoca Hills, Coravoca and stuff, which is, you know, contiguous to Duff's Road. <clears throat> and due to political gerrymandering, meaning changing of the dynamics of a ward, uh, Ward 39 was uh, Cormarshu, two sections of Cormarshu was brought in, three in fact. So it changed the entire dynamics of the ward. Uh, and it changed the profile of the candidate standing. And Duff's Road, for example, is a very small community, about uh, 400 residents. So standing in this ward wouldn't have achieved much for me in terms of actually fighting the ward. For example, contiguous to Duff's Road is Kuamashu Hostels. And you would have known recently during the unrest, um, there was quite a bit of violence. There's a massive criminal activity that went, yes, goes on yes. there. So it would be very difficult for me to campaign there, for example. And uh, it's a predominantly IFP ANC ward. The area of Mount Moriah, which is nearby here, is also an IFP ANC ward. So it's very difficult to have uh, actually uh, stood in this ward. And it would have been very dangerous to campaign in some of the areas, as you well know. I mean, yes, because, fact, because I, have, I remember I remember those nights that you were on the road when there was a major issue happening on that Duff's Road. Well, I'm calling it the Duff's Road here. I don't know what road it was. But there was a big standoff with that community. So you, so obviously you're saying uh, the amount of uh, sort of Indian voters in that area are less. And, and you standing as a candidate there, really your chances in that area would be obviously minimized in that sense. That's that, that what I get. Yes, the the problem is while I'm standing as an independent candidate, you know, I don't have any affiliation to any of the parties, ANC, EFF, or DA, or whatever. But the point is, it will make very difficult campaigning in the area, very dangerous campaigning, and I had to weigh up the options, uh, and then I decided to uh, stand for elections. And in fact, it was a last-minute decision in many respects as well. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that at the last minute, but anyway, uh, okay, let me go to the last minute because I've known you for a while, but I didn't know that you had these uh, political ambitions that you wanted to stand for councillor. Then I heard that you're standing for it. Then I thought maybe you always had this in your head that you were doing it and you were working towards it. Or was it a last minute decision to say, listen, I want to go and stand? What, 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 was it a plan or not or last minute decision? And if so, why? In fact, what had happened in the last two months uh, just uh, after the unrest you know Dalsford was pivotal as well as Phoenix being pivotal to this entire unrest that went on I began getting many many calls and when I say literally hundreds I mean literally hundreds from people in the area uh, asking me to please come and stand there as uh, a candidate because they felt that the incumbent was not serving their needs and a lot of people called my dad he was the previous councillor to that area and they, you know, there was a lot of encouragement that we'll try and get some support for you and, and try and ensure that we, you know, win the award. So after lengthy deliberation and a chat with my dad and stuff, I actually registered two days before closing date. So that's how it came about that I uh, registered as a candidate. Okay. And then why independent? Why did you choose to be an independent candidate? Uh, yeah. Why not affiliate to a party? Um, People always even said to me, rather you be with uh, an organization as the wheels are turning, they've got infrastructure and all of that. Uh, why did you go the independent route? Look, <clears throat> uh, for one, I wouldn't have been able to join a party at that stage to register. And in any event, um, if you look at the number of independent candidates for the 2021 elections, in 2016, there was just over a thousand, thousand and thirty-five, if I'm not mistaken. And this year, there's one thousand seven hundred and eighty odd uh, independent candidates. So there's been a shift in the thinking of, which is virtually about seventy percent increase. You know, uh, or oh, I'm sorry, fifty-eight percent increase in in the number of uh, candidates standing as independents. Mm -hmm. Now, there's going to be a lot of questions being asked. Uh, um, why as an independent and which you 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 asked me as well look local politics local government is not about uh, a political party it is about the person that you put out on the ground 
And uh, if you put out someone who is a party uh, lackey, you probably will get a lackey uh, return because you need competence, capacity, capability, tenacity. And, you know, when residents have a problem, they don't go to the political party. They go to the person that is elected in the area. And if the person is uh, not elected, I mean, not capable or is lackadaisical about how he wants to serve the people, you will not get the return of service. Although local government is controlled by people who are controlling the council, I understand that very well. But at the end of the day, um, if you get a person who is capable of attacking or kicking down the doors, going to the right people, go, going to where the buck stops, you will get service delivery. For example, um, a parks and gardens. Normally, they will go to the front desk to report a matter. But it's important that if the matter is not being resolved, you have to go to where the buck stops, to the head of the department, Metro Water. People can call in. There's a lot of counselors uh, currently. If you have a problem, a water problem, they will do exactly what the resident would do. They would phone in, get a, a reference number, and job done. That is not job done. You've got to push, kick, fight for the residents. That's what a counselor is there. Because public representation means a public servant. And the word servant has a meaning to it. People you know, complain this uh, counselor is not doing anything, is hardly to be seen. That has to change. The dynamics of that has to change, especially at local government, because that's the cold face of uh, service to the people. And that's why I feel, you know, with my ability and capability and knowledge, I would be able to uh, discharge that obligation. Okay, but you might have the ability and the knowledge, uh, capability and the will to want to do it. I always use the word will. You must have the will to want to do something. <clears throat> but don't you not think that lacking this experience in the field may not necessarily bode you well in terms of how to get things done within the municipality? Surely guys who have been there uh, have the uh, know-how to, to the systems, how it works and all of that. Don't you think as an independent it might work against you or do you feel it working for you? Look, my dad was a councillor for three terms, elected councillor. And I, uh, for the last two terms, I was more or less a shadow councillor to him, you know, uh, doing quite a bit of his emailing and stuff like that as part of his assistance and stuff like that. So I have a very good idea. I have a very uh, a satisfactory working knowledge of the <coughs> Municipal Finance Management Act, which is very important. Uh, I understand what uh, goes on in council. <coughs> my dad was a sitting exco councillor. So I used to read all the minutes of all the Exco meetings. So I have a good understanding of what goes on there. Now, uh, besides an academic background, uh, the ground knowledge is fairly entrenched in me. And uh, if you followed me in the media for the last three decades, uh, I've taken up matters of political interest, although it might be provincial or national, but the same would apply if I had to use it uh, you know, at local level. Uh, Mr. Ganesh, have you, have you ever been, I know we spoke about it earlier, in a, in a structure like a party, have you been part of a political party structure before, like a real, like in a party? Yeah, look, I've been with two political parties. One was the Democratic Alliance. Um, okay. And then there was another party that uh, was called the Minorities of South Africa, MOSA. But uh, let's go. Just go well, back to the demo. Let, let's start with the DA first. How long ago the DA? What were you in the DA? And of course, you left the DA. Why did you leave the DA? I was uh, a branch chairperson for the ward that I'm standing in for two terms. I was that means ten years. I was the constituency secretary, and I was elected onto the federal council of the Democratic Alliance. I resigned in 2019, uh, 2016, on the 15th of, 16th of February, 2016. Uh, the reason being I was at loggerheads with the, uh, as they call it, the party bosses. And I joined, well, not joined, but I was invited to uh, head a party called the Minorities of South Africa, MOSA. Uh, this was a party formed by, well, led 
I won't say led. It was arranged to be formed by a one Roy Mudley. Unfortunately for me, it was a bad political decision because uh, this character was still a sitting councillor for the ANC. He had resigned from the DA, became a councillor with the ANC, but wanted to form a party because he knew his days were numbered with the ANC. I was co-opted and uh, I actually stood in this ward, Ward 34, in the 2016 elections as well. Uh, wasn't successful. As, but, as, uh, Mosa, as Mosa. As a Mosa candidate, yes. In the same ward that you're standing in now. Yes, yes. But in that time that you lost that, you didn't win that, that's interesting for me. Was it because of the party you were with? Because it wouldn't have mattered if you if the people knew who you were and the work you've done. Surely that would have carried you rather than Mosa. Or do you feel that Mosa was what weighed you down? Well, you know, if you had to make an analysis of it, sometimes if you look back at the past election, there was blind voting. Uh, people just, you could have put a frog in the picture of a logo and the guys would have voted the frog in, as long as the logo was a party that they supported. So uh, that was the problem. Hopefully, and I will explain this just now, that might change because this, I wouldn't say voters are not well educated, but they have come from a system of voting with the heart and not with the head, especially at local government elections. So what that means is, um, can I go on to that, uh, that aspect so that we can bring it into perspective just which, now? Which aspect? If you allow me. Which aspect? Look. When we vote in this uh, local government elections, we are given two ballot papers. On the one we'll ballot come, paper, we'll you come have... The, we'll come to that. We'll okay. come to Mosa and then we, 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 must, we must talk about that. So you remind me if I don't talk about that, the two ballot okay. papers. Um, so you left the DA, you are, you, you're not happy with the DA. Uh, what is the reason you left the DA? Well, we had some internal problems and I was at loggerheads with the constituency head that uh, headed the constituency I was secretary in. And we uh, had a lot of uh, untoward uh, uh, interactions and I decided I'm going to resign from the DA. And uh, that was on the 16th of February, 2016. Was your dad a counselor for three terms with the DA? Uh, no, uh, two terms with the DA. Two terms. Did he yeah. serve three terms though? Yes. And the third term? No, no. The last two terms was with the Democratic Alliance. The first term was with, in 1996, was with the National Party. Oh, okay. So he's got a long history. Okay, great. Yes. Um, he, was a, he was a former school principal of Gandhi Desai, Sastry College, Sylvester Secondary, and Haven Park Secondary in Phoenix. And after he left education, he re retired from the educational field. He joined politics. But he was involved in community service all his life, being the uh, president of the Inanda Child and Family Welfare Society for 39 years, which is a long term. So your dad had two terms with the DA, then you was the DA. Are the problems, did the problems arise with the DA? Are these problems endemic to the DA that you had that maybe still bog, uh, bogs them down now, the problem you had? I would think so. You know, at, in any political party, once the door closes, uh, it's a different world. Uh, you know, there are so many people hunting for a position in the DA. They will sell their souls. You know, they become Dr. Foster's. They will sell their souls to the party bosses, enamor themselves to the party bosses just to get a position. I was not prepared to do that. I'm never going to be prepared to do that. And uh, there will be people in the DA, even the former provincial uh, leader of the DA will tell you, I never kept quiet. If I felt I needed to speak out, I will speak out. But in politics, you will find that party bosses, when you oppose them, they don't like it. And I will not stop doing that. Well, that's why people ask me about, and one guy was clear when he said to me, you mustn't join any party because you've got a big mouth and they won't tolerate your mouth. So if, you, if you're in a party, I think you've got to toe the party line, whatever it is. Even if you have a differing opinion, you've got to say yes, sir, no, sir. Is that correct? That's why you're also not part of a party? Well, 
I could have been, there, there were many parties that approached me to join them prior to the local government election, but I hadn't at that time made up my mind. You know, as I said, this was the last minute decision to become an independent candidate. So once party caucus okay, so make if, a decision. If, if you, sorry, to, but I was going to ask this question earlier. On. If you are in time, before time, if you were to join a party, let's say the doors open, the window was open, wasn't closed, wasn't too near, which party would you have aligned yourself with and why? Look, I would have aligned myself to a party. I'm not going to name a party, but I would have aligned, aligned myself with a party if they met the criteria that would have satisfied my membership. <laughs> in the sense that I'm very outspoken. I say it like it is. And I will not be subjected to scrutiny in terms of public opinion. So th that might have been a difficult one for many political parties. And look, most of the political parties know me from the media. I've had over about 2,500 articles published in all media uh, for the last two and a half. Come on, uh, don't, be, don't be quiet with us, yeah? Don't play, the, don't play politics, yeah? We, we only know so many parties available. I, I, I put the question, have you gone past that stage now? And you're not going to be for voting for them. If you had a choice before this, who would you have aligned yourself to in terms of your, your thinking, the way the party operates, whatever it is, who would you have aligned yourself with? Look, I wouldn't have aligned myself. To, let's go, tick, let's get the tick list out. Let's uh, uh, take uh, the ANC. I wouldn't be going for the ANC. Let's take the DA. I wouldn't be going for the DA. The uh, EFF, no. Probably, if I had to align myself, might be with the EFF, but on conditions that they accept certain aspects of my candidacy or membership. Now, that's very difficult because you don't decide what the party should accept. They, you accept what they provide to you as, a, as the constitution and membership uh, conditions, etc. So that might have been the one. There were lots of other small parties that contacted me and I, wait, I let's, declined. Let's, let's, and they let's stop right out. there. I think many people will be quite intrigued by your answer that that's what, that's why I was pushing you to something like that to find out who you think you would. To, for you to say EFF will probably shock a lot of people, yeah. So and that's why sometimes we'll deviate from what we we'll talk about to get a bit, get to know a bit about you more. Why the EFF? What what do you see that others are not seeing? Uh, because the EFF, the, if you ask any Indian, the EFF is anti-Indian, anti-Indian rhetoric. Julius Palema is anti-Indian, but here we have Naren Ganesh who. He's saying, I see value in the EFF. You are breaking up there. If you could ask the question again, please. Okay, so a lot of people who are listening here would have wondered why you are aligning, would align, or why you talk about the EFF. Um, what value do you see in the EFF, whereas me and everyone else sees them as anti-Indian, Julius Malema is anti-Indian. What value do you see in the EFF and Julius Malema? I don't see any value in him in his uh, political party. The very fact that he goes on the narrative of attacking a uh, certain <coughs> race group constantly, and that is probably because he had a problem with Praveen Gordhan. Uh, I would be very uh, at pains to actually sit in the same caucus or same membership uh, as the party uh, other members because they would be thinking something that I wouldn't be thinking, and you can't be in a political party when that's happening. It will always cause a, a problem. So I would never subscribe but, but, to the EFF. But I don't know if I heard you correctly. You said, if not the ANC, not the DA, if there's anybody you would align yourself with, it would be the EFF under your conditions. So I'm asking No, no. I said IFP. No, you said I said IFP? not the EFF, the IFP. Hold oh, yes. the phone. If it did was. I hear incorrectly? Did I hear incorrectly? Because you just... I swear to God, you said EFF, and I think people heard as well because they're all going on about. Did EFF. I say EFF? You said EFF. Okay, Dude, you, did, you almost ruined your entire okay, career. Did I apologize. I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't hearing myself. No, 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 no. Certainly not the EFF. No, why I sure. said the IFP? Not that I would have, but there might have been a chance that if I okay, did align myself, let's I just, probably you let's gave just me a choice. Let's just for the sake of you clarify to the guys because everybody said heard you say EFF. So it's not the EFF. Okay, then that is a, that's an error on my part. I apologize. Sorry. Sure. I, I yeah, didn't realize I said that. <laughs> took us off on a tangent there, dude. It was really something that 
I was trying to be very circumspect. Would have shocked me too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Okay, you made a mistake. You me, I, tongue, is that, uh, I couldn't see you as anything with the EFF anyway, but I suppose you could have. Uh, yeah, I've made charges <laughs> against uh, the leader. Yes, which you, I know it didn't make sense at all. So uh, yeah, uh, you said IFP, so it was IFP that you uh, you were aligned yourself with. Yes. Okay. If given it would be the lesser of the so many evils that I would have had to choose. Yes, that's what I mean. I, I don't think I don't think everything they would do was right, but you're choosing the the one that ticks most of your boxes, so to speak. Yes, I suppose, yeah. Okay. IFP also have great respect for the IFP and what they've done, and uh, and I think they can do great things. They're one of the parties that have uh, very little shit going against them, little very little drama uh, on their plate. And uh, yeah, I think they would they would like most of the EF IFP guys I know um, are, are great guys. Uh, just tell me, I'm uh, sort of move on from there. Uh, who is the current ward councillor in the area that you are in now? There's a uh, Dr. Bobby Marad. Or the ward that you are contesting? Yes, it's a Dr. Bobby Mirage. He's a DA councillor? Yes. And you would, you would say in that area, he's your biggest, comp if he's current, he's the biggest competition to you? Well, this year's uh, election is going to be a bun fight. Uh, it might have been a foregone conclusion an election or two ago. But I think the dynamics have changed uh, from uh, the people that I'm, uh, I've got canvassing for me and stuff like that. Uh, things might change this election because what has happened, War 34 has been gerrymandered as well. There were three areas that uh, were chipped off the uh, uh, ward. The areas of Parlock, Bakerville Gardens and a part of Newlands East, which the majority of residents were Indian and colored uh, resi uh, uh, residents, ratepayers. And that was at that the last election were primarily DA uh, inclined. So that has been removed from the ward. So the dynamics have changed now. And uh, I can't say that he is now my biggest uh, opponent or opposition and more so there's more that have come into the fray you know the smaller parties so it's going to be a bit of a bun fight uh, yeah, this I, year I, I agree with you on the bun fight and things have changed a lot but let's take let's take this uh, is it dr bobby maraj is it dr bobby maraj that you're saying your councillor in area yes so yes. you being in an area you uh, obviously are going to try to unseat him where and how has Dr. Bobby Marad failed to deliver in the area? Let's just talk about where he's failed. What are his failing? What hasn't he done? How hasn't he serviced the area? Well, from the calls that I've been getting, and they've been regular and uh, uh, frequent, uh, he doesn't attend to all the calls. He doesn't attend to them satisfactorily. Uh, when he's called to attend certain problems, he doesn't uh, come people come to his office, they don't, they get shoddy treatment. So in that respect, uh, there might be problems for him, but I'm not going to worry about his weaknesses. I'm going to worry about my strengths. And uh, that's where I'm uh, leading my campaign. Fair enough. What I was saying is I don't want to know about, I, 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 by the way, that's admirable of you. And a lot of guys want to just attack other people and not talk about what they're going to do. So that's admirable. Uh, that you don't want to attack him. But what I'm saying is, what I want to know is, the areas in that, so obviously in the ward, if you want to win my vote, there are things that are not done well that you're going to work on. It. These things, whether it's the sewage, whether it's the street lights, whether it's the parks and gardens that have been neglected, that would be your strong point to me as a voter. What what are you targeting that hasn't been done that you can fix? That you can do better than Look, me? Let's take the dynamics of the ward for, for Firstly, it is one of those few wards that has about 60, 15 informal settlements interspersed amidst the formal sector. That immediately presents a challenge because you have a rate paying sector that subsidize, that sees themselves subsidizing a non rate paying sector. So the important thing there is to ensure that there's some kind of liaison between the two communities. That's going to be a bit major task because it has been when my dad was there. Uh, I don't see it happening right now uh, with the current councillor. So that that aspect, firstly, is going to be a tough task. And I have to work at it to 
convince the leaders of uh, the informal sector and you know each little settlement has uh, their own leadership and then get the civic associations of the various areas contiguous to to uh, the informal sector to start working together in terms of making sure that they don't interfere with each other that they can live uh, peacefully but be that as it may there are many other problems that comes into play the uh, uh, fact that informal sectors do not have proper sanitation, adequate water supplies, there's theft of electricity. So those matters will have to be addressed uh, strongly. And then, you know, my take is that if I had to come in as a uh, counselor, I would approach the heads of departments firstly as a uh, coalition uh, uh, solution to get them uh, to can see I just, how we... Can, can, I just, can I just take you backwards and understand one dynamic? You mentioned there were 15 informal settlements. Yes. And these informal in settlements, around... were, they, were they there before Mr. Bobby Maraj came in as a counselor or came in after that? No, they were there uh, <coughs> long before long okay. before my dad even came in as a counselor. Oh, is it? So I'm trying to understand something here. When we know informal settlements and the black vote goes as a loyal vote to the ANC or a black party, how is it the DA one with so many informal settlements that the DA one this one? I find that to be uh, the dynamic to be uh, unique. Yeah. No. Look. Uh, prior to this election, there were about uh, six, uh, nine areas that were involved because it it spanned across the highway into Parlock, uh, Green, uh, Bakerville Gardens, and. Uh, Part of Newlands East. So the population of the so called colored and Indian voters were much greater than that of the informal settlement. So that is how that uh, ward became a DA. Okay, all right. That, yeah, otherwise it didn't make sense. And now, and now with more informal settlements, has the dynamic shifted towards uh, a black shifted? Look, we will not know this until 1 November uh, because taking away a potential voter base uh, and uh, leaving the uh, or and changing or reducing the number of voters there is going to be a major problem for all the parties uh, concerned because if you could if you look at the so-called black african uh, vote within the informal settlements there's also a fight there as well between the eff the anc the ifp the uh, acdp pac udm so the, there's going to be a dilution of votes in that uh, settlement. Uh, but the reality is, uh, you know, like I said in the beginning, I'm not looking at party politics. I'm looking at the kind of candidates, the caliber of candidates that are presenting themselves for election, because we are not going to select a party to represent us when it comes to a problem in, in terms of Sweden. It will be the actual candidate, the capability, the, 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 verb, the, the, the commitment to solve the problem and do it expeditiously. But, but do, you realistic, do you realistically believe, whether it's the informal settlement or the formal settlement, that majority of voters will vote for the person or the party? Where do you, where do you see the vote going, person or party? Yeah. Sadly, the party. Now, if we look at the last 2016 election, there were about 18,700 voters registered in the ward, of which about 11,500 voted. And the DA received 5,500 votes, which was just on 50%. So, uh, and the ANC received 43%. So that dynamic is going to change significantly this time around, because the ANC in itself is at war with itself. So, that's going to dilute the ANC vote. The EFF might come in a little stronger due to what's been happening. Uh, the IFP might come in stronger. And I'm just talking party. I should be talking my uh, own uh, uh, candidacy as an independent. But if we're looking at party dynamics, that's how it's going to happen. Informal settlements in your area, we just spoke about that. Uh, you're coming in as a ward councillor and you start tackling issues such as the crime rate, the, uh, in, the uh, illegal electricity and all of that. Uh, many, may, the ANC and other uh, wards and other councillors are wary of tackling informal settlements on these issues because they will lose the vote. Let's say you became a ward councillor, right? 
And we've heard this video before about the numbers game. The numbers game is where you keep your voters happy and you get another term in office. So if you have a majority, let's say you even win the war, even with the majority black population in formal settlements, well, will you really take on the informal settlements in terms of what needs to be done, pay for electricity and all of that, and cut off electricity supplies, uh, cut off the illegal electricity? Surely that will antagonize the voter database, voter base, and then you rather just leave them alone. As what's happening in all other wards, they are being left to their own devices because they will turn on the on the on the councillor. Look. Uh, that might be the uh, rhetoric that will go around. But the truth is, you have to engage. They are people as well. For whatever circumstances that landed them in those situations, uh, we've got to take cognizance of that. So one has to get into constructive engagement with the communities because we're talking of social cohesion, social harmony and stuff like that. But it also impacts on the economic aspect of a ward. Uh, you know? So it's not going to be easy. I know the, the, the challenge is going to be massive. But with diplomacy, with the constructive engagement of the leaderships of those areas, together with the leadership of the civic associations and stuff. So I'm not thinking straight away I'm going to go there and, and, and solve the criminal aspect of the ward or uh, have all the roads well tarred, etc. It's going to be a task, but I'm prepared to put my uh, foot to the pedal and make sure that it can be accelerated by going to the authorities uh, or to the highest uh, uh, or where the buck stops yeah. to ensure that things get done. And that's what local government is about, uh, the local government representative, to fight to the last to make sure that he can. Look, we're not going to, we're going to fail. There's going to, time, going to be times when I'm going to fail. That's the reality of the situation, noting how our uh, electoral system has designed municipalities and stuff. But you, it, it's a ruling party that controls the purse and then dictates the terms. But we've got to change that paradigm and it must be changed fast. Otherwise, the people will continue to suffer. And we can fight that from inside. If you get more people to look at the sensibility of, of, of getting uh, uh, people answerable to the electorate and not to a political party, things can get done. Um, thanks for that. Uh, tell me, today we had a conversation with a guy from uh, Service Delivery. I, I keep forgetting the name of that party, uh, Kevin uh, Mervyn Governor. He was mentioning salaries of a ward councillor. What is the salary of a ward councillor? I haven't checked last what's the salary, but I think it's over about 40,000, if I'm not mistaken, for a metro, for metro uh, council. Especially the yeah, Tequini one. The but last, I'm not sure. I about, last I heard is about 35,000. 35,000 is before tax or so, after tax? I think that, well, I, if I mentioned the uh, figure 40, I might have, uh, it might it will be bef uh, before tax. Yeah. Before tax. Because that guy today was giving me figures. He like in a ward councillor's uh, thing is 60,000 plus, and after tax is 35,000. That's a lot of tax for someone to be paying. I don't think that's the, I don't think that's the right figure. I don't know where you got that figure from. I think 35 to 40, actually 35, 30, 38 was was uh, was was the figure I know. Casey, if uh, you know me uh, for the short time that you do, you will know I'm not really interested in what the figure is in terms of the salary. I never was. Yeah, yeah. But I just and... I just want I just wanted some clarity because he was giving me a figure that was I thought was way out, and yet he's somebody uh, supposedly knowing stuff. He's just. He said the well, MP, it, Shamim Takur was earning over 100,000 Rand or whatever. Even that I thought was, uh, but I think it's about 60 to 70,000. But anyway, I was just trying to uh, see, pick your brain on, on, on what's, what's happening there. Uh, and, uh, Nare, uh, the this, this story that people talk about ward councillors always you hear, many people will say, I never knew my ward councillor. I don't know who he is. I don't know his number. He's never been around. I don't know. So many people we talk to, they don't know who the ward council is. Whose fault is that really? How will you? Is it the person's fault to never find out who's the councillor? Is it the councillor's fault for not going around and saying, I'm your ward councillor. If you need something, come to me. Here's my number. Who's really at fault and how will you change that dynamic? Let's take it from the beginning. The main fault is with our electoral system. We, have an, we, have a, we, are, we live in a democracy, but we are not democratic in the sense that it is only at local government election that we have what we call a mixed representation uh, system. 
50% of the elected councillors uh, councillors are elected directly by the people. 50% are selected or appointed by the party. So when you put your uh, cross against a candidate, you are directly electing that candidate who you should know as a knowledgeable uh, voter that that candidate is rep going to represent you. So you know the name of the person you're voting. Sadly, there again, people just put the cross against the uh, logo, no matter what the name is there. It could be a frog or a snake, metaphorically speaking, they'll put a cross there. But when you get to the party list, now there's a system they work out the PR votes, the proportional representation. There's a formula, it's a complicated formula. But just say the party gets 10 uh, PR votes, they will appoint a person to a place, a ward. You don't know who the person is. The party, will, before the campaign will, uh, uh, election, will campaign vigorously. But the moment the uh, election is over, they don't come to the constituency and tell the uh, residents, look, we've appointed Mr. X into your ward. So the people do not know who the second councillor is to the ward because there are 210 councillors in, 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 in the municipality. 105 or 220, I think. 110 are directly elected and 110 are appointed. So you, when you put your cross against the party name, you are actually giving the party carte blanche to do with your vote as they please. You have no say in who they appoint. So that's not an elected representative. That's an appointed Darren, representative. Darren, please, I, w I want you to try and, if I'm confused, I'm sure people out there are confused. I only got to know about this public representative, representative uh, about a couple of months ago. I never knew this PR existed ever in my life. I never knew about it. I'm 36 years old. I still didn't know that for the last 36 years. But here's the thing. Talk me through this. So there's 50 watts, right? Let's say 50 watts. Let's just say example, 50 okay. watts, right? So we go to vote for 50 councillors, right? Yes. So 50 people win. There'll be 50 winners, right? Yes. As so individuals. are you saying if I voted John Doe in, he can be taken out and the party can put somebody in, somebody else there or those other 50 go somewhere else. Where? How does that work? So let's work at 50. There's 50 watts. We All go right. to vote. Are we not voting the okay. entire 50? Where are these other people coming in the PR? How do they fit in? Just educate okay. me there. All right. Let's just take the figure 50 watts. Now, if there's 50 watts, there's going to be 100 councillors in the uh, council. 50 will be directly elected. That means when you put the name against the name of the person on the ballot paper, the most number of votes wins that ward as an elected that's, ward council. So that's fifty. So those fifty guys are there. You can't take them out. You have to no, take them out. There's got to be a by-election and stuff like okay. that. That's another so, then, story. so, so, so the guy I vote for is the guy going to be wins. He's going to be the council. That, that you can't change that. Yes. Right. Okay. Right. Now, now the second ballot paper has a list of parties only. So if you I align to a party or want to support a party, you put a cross there. And then when they tally all the votes, they work, there's a system in which they apportion uh, PR seats to the parties. Uh, they, it's the total number of votes cast by the number of voters okay, in the it, ward. It, 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 so, right. so if party A gets 20, party B gets 12, eventually you'll get 50. It will come to 50. So they, that's how they apportion. But what I'm saying about the proportional, uh, which I've been in, in media all along, uh, disputing the validity of a proportional uh, vote system, is that when you give that party your vote on the second ballot paper, you are giving them carte blanche to do as they please with their vote. If they put Mr. Y into that place and you know Mr. Y is a dud, you've got no, no chance to change okay. that because that's, it's a party decision. Let's, let's backtrack. 50 councillors got elected, right? right? Now we bring in 50 PR councillors, right? Yes. So let's say John Doe is the elected councillor for that one. Where does a PR councillor fit? What is his job? Does he go behind John Doe? Is he part of John Doe? Is he part of his team? Where does he fit in in those? Where does a PR councillor actually fit in? What is his duty? And how is he accountable and to who? The PR councillor has exactly the same duties as an elected ward councillor in attending problems of the ward. He earns exactly the same salaries as the ward councillor. Exactly the same salary. So if I'm an appointed councillor as a PR councillor, I can do very little and earn the same salary. And that's where our problem is. That's where the electorate needs to get more educated and question the party. 
Who are you so, putting? What's your yes, fear risk like? So, as I have been shocked out of my mind, I'm just going to reiterate what you say. There's a there's a councillor that is John Doe. He what? A what councillor? What councillor? He's counselor. elected. He must do the work. He's the main guy. He's the top dog, right? Now you bring somebody as his supposed understudy or shadow, right? Who will get the same amount of money, but in reality, we don't even know who this guy is or what he does. And I've never heard of this PR counselor, but he's getting the same money as the top dog. Is that what? Is that right? What I'm he will all, the PR counselor will, yeah, he will also get an allowance to run an office in the ward from the council. So, and his responsibilities of handling the matters pertaining to the council will be exactly the same as the ward council. It's just a status thing that the elected ward councillor is generally called to all the meetings as, as the first choice councillor. But the PR councillor has the same has status in terms of representation of the ward. So the perks, the, uh, the telephone, uh, mobile allowance, etc., etc., et is the same for both the councillors. There's no difference. So, so what you're saying is everybody complains about the ward councillor, ward councillor not doing their work, overwork, whereas we actually have two councillors and still the job doesn't get done. We have two salaries exactly. paid, That's two point. allowances, and still the job doesn't get done. That's exactly the fight I've been having all along. And thankfully, uh, for the next national election, the Concord has ruled that independent uh, candidates can stand for elections. There'll, I think there'll be 100 candidates out of 400 who will be independent for national government, which was never the case before, because you had to be in national. We only vote for the party uh, on the ballot paper. But now you will so have Mr. individuals. Mr. Naren, you, you, you spoke about a good point here. When is the national? 20? 2024. 2024. 2024. Independence can stand for national government. Yes. The Concord has ruled, has made a ruling this year yes. that uh, uh, they can stand as independent candidates because it's unconstitutional uh, to disallow or it's an, uh, the right of a person to stand for national election. Uh, under our constitution. So the ruling has been made. Parliament so has to decide Mr. on Naran the dynamics Giresh, of um, Mr. Naran Giresh, I put this to you. In 2024, what's my chances of making the national government? If you got me on your side, you'll, you'll do well, I think. <laughs> well, the <laughs> fact is, you can't. What I'm saying is, the opportunity is there. The Concord has ruled that yes. I, you, anybody watching here, can stand as an independent candidate for national government. Nothing's impossible. Yes. Yeah. So that's so, but that must that must the proportional system is you know applicable quite a, in quite a few parts of the world, but it does not show actual democracy because democracy is a government of by and for the people. But the proportional representation is a government of by and for a political party. Because the political party decides for the voter. You give them the money, they decide how they want to spend it, kind of. So it's not fair in terms of democracy and democratic order. So that must change. And I hope in time it will change to the point where we will only have uh, directly elected uh, res uh, 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 representatives to government. Because at the end of the day, you, you have to have them directly accountable to the people. By having a political party, politi let me quickly add one thing. Do you know it's very difficult for an elected ward councillor to be dismissed from their party? Uh, because once they dismiss, the party can't replace an elected ward councillor. There has to be a by-election. But if you have a PR councillor, you can fire and hire a PR councillor at will without any by-election. So you will find that political parties, even if the councillor is not performing very well, they won't get rid of him. They will keep him there because it's a costly uh, affair to run a by-election. So yeah, These let's, are important. Let's, let's... Let's, let's just stop there. And that's, a, that's something I was questioning the guy today on my three o'clock feed and we're educating the, our public here today. So you are confirming that that is why nothing really happens. You can complain and complain and complain about the councillor, but let's use the DA, for example, for the example. The DA is not prepared to remove that councillor because then they will have to go to a buy. They can't replace him with another DA guy. So they're hesitant to, re, to replace him. So they will allow this incompetent guy to continue rather than going for a by-election. Is that, have I read that correctly? 
Exactly, and that goes across the board for all elected ward councils. They, if they belong to a party, that party is not going to uh, remove them. Uh, and uh, that's the sad part about it, because that's where service delivery is being compromised. You've got a lot of incompetent, undeserving people who are just sitting, who are lame ducks in council, uh, who will put their hand up only when it's voting time. They, they, they do nothing constructive, and then the party will just keep them there. Because if they remove them, it's a very costly affair to run another by-election. And that's why they, they don't do that. But a PR councillor, you can kick, uh, remove a PR councillor every couple of weeks if he's not competent. Nobody has a problem with that because it doesn't cost the party anything. And, and so, Mr. Key, look, I'm not even worried about the PR councillor because I've never heard of the PR councillor. He's useless. I don't know why they... Even, I, don't know, I don't know why the taxpayers are paying for this PR councillor in the first place. 80% of the people on the platform now can guarantee you I've never heard of a PR councillor. But going back to this, to the holding the councillor responsible, don't you think there should be something in place where the party can remove and put in another candidate so that we can go for service delivery? Because as long as this continues, even if I'm a councillor, I will realize, hell man, say what you want, you're really not going to get rid of me. So I'll just continue. Well, that that the Electoral Act has to be changed for that to happen because that is governed by the Electoral Act. And uh, it's not governed by the local municipality or the party itself. Uh, the Electoral Act decides that should an elected ward, because look, you are now taking out, away the mandate of the people when you remove a person who has been elected by the people. So the elected ward councillor is mandated by the people, directly elected. So you can't have the party decide. Look, th there's always a solution to that, but it has to be via the Electoral Act, which has to be legislated or promulgated at parliamentary level as well. Okay, great. We're just getting some uh, great insight into that. Uh, but I was going back to my question that started this. Um, if you're a councillor, if you become a councillor, like I'm saying, the common thing is, let's leave the PR councillor out for now, right? Let's just take the councillor. Yeah. People complain, I've never seen the councillor. He doesn't come here. I don't know his phone number. I don't know how to get a hold of him. So whose responsibility is, is it? the people who need to know the councillor and how much effort should the councillor make to tell the people in his ward entirely, here's my details, here's my number, here's how you get all of me. If you've got a problem, get all of me. How would you do okay. it and whose responsibility? Look, I think it's a, it's a two-way uh, yes. system there because the people who are electing you sh will know on the ballot paper who they elected if you're an elected ward councillor. But it is the responsibility of the councillor once elected to engage the community and i've put out videos as to i won't call it a manifesto but what i intend doing for one because of my knowledge of the war the dynamics the geography the demographics the needs the demands i will obviously engage immediately with the main uh, organizations there whether it's social uh, sporting uh, civic uh, the cpf and one of the things i will do is every four to six months i will call community hall meetings where I engage the community in terms of what their needs are, the greater needs that I'm uh, not uh, attending to, so that that engagement is continuous. There has to be a continuum between uh, resident, ratepayer, and the councillor, because at the end of the day, I might perceive certain things to be happening in the ward, but the people might have a different idea. No ward councillor that I know calls a public uh, community hall or town hall meeting with the residents after they elected. They'll Occasionally, they'll call a meeting. You know, when there's a by-election, they'll get the parliamentary uh, representative coming there to babble about this, that, and the other. But the real nitty-gritty, they don't engage the community. Uh, some of them don't even attend the community civic uh, association or rate pay association meetings. But, but let, now, that is... That is let, me, let, let me cut in there, right? Let, you know, we just discussed the accountability of a councillor, right? That is really... Yeah. Nobody can hold him to account. We not, not a party. Nobody can hold him to account. So here's a guy, <clears throat> human being. Nobody can hold me to account. I'm going to get paid a salary for five years. I'll do my bare minimum. By you calling a meeting in a city hall, in a community hall, you are asking people to come and give you their problems, to put more problems on you. Why would any human being in his right mind who's there to, to make money bring more problems onto himself unless you are that inclined to really serve the people because you're asking for them to bring me your problems. And in reality, we're seeing that's not happening because 
So it's going to take somebody with that, what, in politics, somebody who really, really want a will to help the people? Of course. Exactly. I, I mentioned earlier, uh, there's a difference. There's something about being a public representative. It means being a public servant. Now, that's why we have the problems, because people, the people who sit there for five years do very little expect a salary. If you want to work for the people and you want to put yourself up for election, then you should be prepared to work. This is not a, a, a holiday. And my, my track record in terms of service, uh, service to the community, although it might be at a higher level in terms of national issues and stuff like that, I've never, I've never earned a salary in this last 20 years from any council, but I've been doing at times more than what councillors used to do. Not because of anything else, not that because I'm getting a tip or something, but it's because I believe that service to your countrymen is probably the highest calling if you want to serve. But if you want to serve, you've got to serve with dedication, commitment. Uh, you've got to have the competence and the capacity to do so. A lot of our councillors really don't have that. And that's one of the problems why uh, a lot of the uh, non-service delivery complaints come about. And you asked about the town hall meeting. Well, I'm going to do it. Uh, if the 100 problems come in, then I've got to be, I've got to take the body punches with regards to that and try and ensure that, because look, you've got 100 problems, 20 might be of similar nature, which can be attended, you know, in one aspect, another 30 in another. So in the terms of that, I'll be able to sort that kind of thing out. But uh, not engaging the community. And if the community doesn't come, then they can't point a finger to the councillor that he's not engaging with them. You know, but very few councillors, if any, that I know do that. Occasionally, they'll have a little uh, street meeting or something, but that's, and I know from the DA, the DA is what we call a tick boxing. Just before the election, before the candidates put themselves up for election, you'll find they need to do street meetings, publications in the newspaper, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So all these, uh, there'll be helter-skelter among the candidates running for your, to be high up on the PR list. I know of, I've got personal friends in the DA who love to be high up on the PR list. So they'll do anything to please the bosses to get high on the PR list. So if the party wins, if the party wins 20 seats, you should be between number one and 20. If you're number 21, you're not going to make it. So you see, the, the, game is, the game is rough when it comes to personal agendas and, and personal you ambitions. Touched on something, you touched on uh, something and you said about competent counselors and all of that, right? <clears throat> I'm going to say this, but I have to say it with uh, trepidation, but I know there's a little bit of truth in it, right? I don't know about recently, but I know previously. In my area even, there was a lady who was unemployed, sitting at home, so the political party comes along, they find her there, they say, come do some work. So she becomes a little bit of work here and there, putting up the lights or doing some cleaning and whatever. Suddenly she becomes an activist. And then a couple of months or a year later, she's a counselor. She's a ward counselor. So in my knowledge of seeing counselors in the years gone by, like I'm saying, I'm going to say this with inverted commas, most of the counselors, people who became counselors weren't the sharpest tools in the shed. They weren't the brightest sparks. They weren't the guys who are top of the class or whatever. So the type of people who are becoming counselors, I'm talking about many that I knew previously back in the day. I'm not sure even now though, but they they obviously had almost nothing else to do. They ended up in politics if they, if, if by default, almost the same. It wasn't somebody who was active all along doing something. By default, they ended up in politics. That's why I find none of them to be incompetent. They're just useless. They had no skill set at all. And they became counselors. Do you that, can you have you seen that? That's true, absolutely true. You know, one of the things that a counselor needs to have a working knowledge of is the Municipal Finance Management Act, because counselors are supposed to sit on portfolio committees, you know, like the finance uh, um, management committee, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. <laughs> and uh, although although they'll get training on that, but if many of them don't bother to actually know it because to be constructive in, in, in those committees, you've got to have a good working knowledge and challenge the issues. And if you are, are, are you know, blasé about wanting to know the academic aspect of counselorship, it will reflect in the actual groundwork that you do. So you're right. You know, you see counselors because a lot of people talk, oh, I'm an activist, I'm a social activist, I work for the community and stuff. That might be fine, but counselor work is not just being a social or a political activist or a community activist. It goes beyond that. Firstly, it takes dedication. 
especially in South Africa now, where service delivery is a horrible issue. You've got to have the commitment to serve. If you don't have that, you will fail and you will be targeted and complained about. I mean, I can tell you something, you know, uh, like, and I will use this because it was the major party that I belonged to, the Democratic line. My dad was there. He resigned. He retired when he was 78 years old. And there was complaints that he's too old for the party. Yet the councillor that is standing against me, 78 this year, is standing for elections again. The double standards by the DA in various aspects worries me. But you see, when you've got people who are yes men to the party bosses, then you'll get into position. Believe me when I tell you this. Um, when I resigned in 2016 from the DA, I resigned day after a federal council meeting in Cape Town. I stood up in the city council chambers and everyone who's watching here from the DA will, can go and find the minutes. I stood up and I told Musi Maimani, Musi, they're coming after you. What happened? A month and a year and a half later, Musi was gone. Once the door closes, it's a different ball game inside. And if you look at that kind of a party, they've some of the leading black uh, uh, members, like Lindiwe Mazibuko, Herman Mashaba, Musi Maimani, how come they've left? Patricia DeLille, how come they've left? There's got to be problems in that uh, party. So like that, all other parties have the problem. The ANC has got the RDT, the Ramaphosa section. So once the That's door it. of so politics I'm gonna, closes. I'm going to ask, ask this of you. Tomorrow I'm hosting uh, Nicole Graham of the DA, right? So I'm going to yes. ask you to send me about five to ten questions that I can put to the DA. Not to roast Nicole Graham. My idea is not to roast her or whatever. But to ask the questions that others want to ask that I don't really have the knowledge of whatever to find out things about the DA. Because let me tell you my story. I punted the DA in many ways as the strongest opposition in this country. I punted the DA in the sense of what they've done. I mean, look at the Western Cape, a well-run province, the best, one of the best-run provinces in the country. So the DA has all the good things going for it, but yet there's this underlying shit that keeps happening. Is it because they're successful? How come is it that they're still getting things right? And the DA has so much of potential, so to speak, but are people just running it down or what? I don't talk about the DA too much, but just give me some idea that do you think the DA has the potential to be much better than what it is and it's failing itself? Look, any party has the potential to do better than what it does. The thing with the DA is its historical past. It came from, uh, well, it started with the Progressive Federal Party, became the Democratic Party, uh, joined with the um, uh, National Party, the National uh, NPP, and then it amalgamated with the good uh, good party, the independent uh, Democrats of Patricia DeLille. So its genesis, its metamorphosis has come from a racial background. So, and, and, and you've got to admit, elections in South Africa is very much racially orientated. You'll get the so-called black parties, the Indian parties, et cetera, et cetera. So to integrate that, it's going to take, it's going to take a while. And uh, people need to understand, especially like with the DA, there's still this perception, and I've experienced it, the white cabals, you know, who control the, because quite a bit of the funding of the DA comes from some of the big uh, white corporates. And politics is about money. You support the people that support you. You know, it's a scratch me, scratch your back kind of story. So in that terms, they've got to look at the objectives and the mandate of where they're being supported from. However, there are elements within the DA who are genuinely good people, who genuinely serve. But in terms of the power politics that comes into play, I think they have a problem. And they are, they've lost ground from, from the time I was there. They have lost ground uh, you, locally, you, provincially. The national. fact that the DA is, is the strongest opposition or has been the strongest opposition up to now, do you think the small parties and the independents and all of this, by taking away from the DA, actually strengthens the ANC? I don't think it will strengthen the ANC per se. Um, I think it will strengthen parties across the board because of the number of parties contesting. I think there's over six, seven hundred parties contesting. Well, I think that's for the national election. But as many parties, 20 to 15 to 20 parties per uh, municipality that are contesting. So there's going to be a dilution of votes. How much will go to the EFF, ANC, IFP, etc.? That will be up to the uh, specific ward. Uh, strengthening the ANC, I do not think so. Because the ANC on its own is it's imploding. 
and you could see with the Jacob Zuma situation the, the, the of recent times, the unrest was part of that. In fact, the area that I was, there were six people or three people killed, murdered uh, a couple of weeks ago who were campaigning for the ANC. So within the ranks, there's troubles. How much it's going to be strengthened, I do not know. I, I can't uh, comment on that. Yeah, obviously, obviously we all can't. We, <coughs> we wait with bated breath to see what happens after the 1st of November. <coughs> just this other point before we start to close up now. I've noticed this in areas, uh, for example, they know that um, Chatsworth is a predominantly, uh, like city council would know, Chatsworth has voted for the DA. Watts, 56, 70, whatever, voted for the DA. And I've seen this in the water crisis issue, and some people might see it in other areas. <clears throat> when the oil of Chatsworth went down with water issues, and when the tankers were being deployed, the tankers went to the ANC ward, and the DA wards got left out in the picture, out of the picture. You can make a who are, you can say whatever you want. The fact of the matter is one tanker servicing two wards, but three tankers sitting in an ANC ward. This is the reality of what happens. This happens in reality. So I'm going to say to you, even you will go to city council and say, I need this area cleaned here, yeah, the pathways. They say, yeah, yeah, okay, they take your page. They put it underneath here. Yeah. Oh, you independent. All right, put it here, yeah. put it one side. We'll come to you. And then they go service an ANC ward first. This happens in reality. I don't think you can deny it. How will you get around that? Because I've seen it happen. I know it happens. Voters get punished for not voting for the ANC because ANC is ruling the municipality. How do you see yourself going around that or making it better? Or will you just be that person, put the request through, and say, listen, I tried my best. Council has said no. Well, if that was my intention, I wouldn't be standing. But here's the thing. You know, uh, the municipality, the ruling party are very averse to negative criticism. Now, most elected ward councillors or those PR councillors who belong to party do not have the uh, permission in a manner of speaking. They do, but uh, the party bosses watch them. They cannot go and expose themselves in the media and put themselves in the media because they have to protect the party image. So they're scared to go and take on the party publicly. As an independent, I wouldn't be. I, I've got a very good relationship with the press. And I will take, if there's something lacking and not happening, I will make sure that it's exposed. I mean, to lay a charge against the municipality. When, the DA was in the council when the integrity, when the forensic report was out against the corruption there. They did nothing. The IFP was there. The EFF was there. It took a man in the street to go and lay a charge there. So I, I will not stop at the first step. I will go to where the buck stops. And I, I you know, it's a, it's a passion to make sure that people get what they deserve. If you pay a rand in tax and you're getting 80% back, 80 cents back, I think that's fair return for, for service delivery. Because at the end of the day, um, if the councillors are scared to talk because they belong to a political party, because everything is monitored by the political party. They cannot say that they allow their caucus leader to speak on their behalf. The freedom of speech is, should be there. If I'm an independent, I'm not going to bother about a party leader or something like that. I will say it like it is. I might be wrong. I can be corrected. But when it comes to the issue of service delivery, I will take it to where the buck stops. If the buck is not stopping there, because quite often they like to have the bucks where the buck stops, I will make sure it's exposed uh, in the media so that when it's exposed in the media, uh, we in involve the pro province and we involve national. And once that happens, I'm more than certain we will get uh, service delivery. But I'm, it, it's, a, it's a little caution that I put out. For people to vote, scrutinize your candidate, challenge him like how you are challenging me. Uh, make sure that when you are putting that cross, you are convinced that you're not putting a cross because the logo is next to that candidate. You put a cross because the person that's going to serve you is going to fight for your need. He might not always succeed, but he will take the fight till the 15th round. I, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly on that one because even when I was other parties, I was at the UIM and some other parties were putting candidates out. As much as I felt for the parties or wanted to support the party, the candidate they were putting forward wasn't good enough. They were, And that's where people are going to fail. They're going to vote for the party and not for the candidate. 
and then they're going to find themselves in the same situation again where the candidate can't produce. So I'm I'm in agreement with you that vote for the best person. Even if in your ward is an ANC guy and he can do the job, I feel you need to put the best person there to do the job. Can I just say this uh, uh, thing, uh, Katie? You know, as an example, what you get. Just say there's two parties, party A and party B. Say you are in party A and you align to party A, you like party A, and they've got a candidate standing, and you detest party B, they they don't uh, resonate with you, etc. But you know the candidate from party B, when you call him at 2 o'clock in the morning, he'll come to you. When you've got a problem, he's there. When you go to him, you'll solve it. But you know the candidate that you are voting for just because of the logo that you like is a dud. You know, he's one of those who, like you said, will sit in council, do nothing for much of the time. Vote for the person in Party B. Because that's what service delivery is about. It's about that person, you, the foot soldier you put on the ground. Because th then you won't have much to complain about if you're getting service delivery, would we? And as I said in the beginning, so, uh, local government is at the coal face of service delivery more than any other. National <coughs> policies, provincial policies are different. But <coughs> local delivery is the responsibility of the man or woman you put on the uh, ground. So for those watching and listening, it's important to become educated in that aspect so that that paradigm changes from, hey, I'm a DA or an ANC supporter, let me support AA. The ANC or DA will put a snake there and you'll vote for the snake and then complain. Change that. Yeah, because, Change that now. Because often, and I've seen the parties putting candidates because they don't even know who the candidate is. The candidate was referred by somebody. They got that guy. They put him there. They said, let's put him there. Hasn't been fully vetted. He hasn't got a track record or whatever. But let me put this question to you from Mark Sue Shankar, who many people have the same thing. I've asked some other candidates and other candidates as well have been on the program. They say independence, one man, small parties. Let's just talk independent. He says, you can't really make a difference in council. They'll give you a few minutes of talk time. What can you really achieve? I think he's talking about you talking in council. I think a ward councillor is doing more work on the ground. Maybe it's a bit off. Let's put him right and the others right. Uh, he says most yeah. times they agree with the ANC. A vote for an independent like you is a lost vote. It's a vote for the ANC. How would you respond to that? Obviously, Mark Shushanka is obviously not in council, but uh, making changes is not about that uh, one or two minutes that you have to speak. A councillor is also involved in portfolio committees, which I'm sure he's ignorant of. But be that as it may, um, changes can happen at those portfolio committees. You can become a force within a portfolio committee. You can prevail with your colleagues to look at the bigger picture rather than the power struggle picture. So important in that aspect, uh, you might have one minute to address on a certain issue, you know, because they have time limits depending on your uh, percentage of uh, uh, representation in parliament. They allocate time and so on. But, uh, a lot of changes can happen in those portfolio committees that a person belongs to. And uh, it's important for councillors to have some kind of knowledge, capability to sit on those portfolio committees. Sometimes you just sit up because your party uh, puts you into a portfolio committee. Now, in my case, I can choose which committee I want to sit in if I'm elected. Because as an independent, I'm not dictated by the party as to where I should sit. So in that respect, I will make the noise when necessary. How much I can achieve will depend on how much work I put in and how much I can convince people. People might say you can't do much when the ruling party overrules you because it's a numbers game. Yes, but uh, Helen Sussman, for example, in the apartheid days, and I, I'm low to uh, refer to that, but just as an example, she was a low, lone PFP, Progressive Federal Party uh, MP in Parliament against the National Party, yet her voice resonated the world over. So it doesn't mean that you're independent. And there's coming, there's coming to a point where there's going to be coalitions. If you get sufficient number of candidates being elected as independents who do not have the mandate to any political party, only to the people, because the people become your de facto employer. You might be employed by the municipality, but the resident, the ratepayer, is your de facto employer. You're answerable to the resident. There's going to come a time when it's going to change. And if it doesn't start now, 50 years from now, we'll have the same conversation. The change has to start, but it has to start with the paradigm that is meshed in 26 or 27 years of the same old rigmarole. And that's where we stand.
And we must change. We must change because service delivery is very important. You're paying rates and taxes. You've got to get service back. Look at the degradation of our municipality. It's horrible. And, and, and it's up to the public representative, the public servants, might I add, to start being servant. You know, there's servanthood and servitude. Servitude is where you are forced to do service. But servanthood, you do it because you want to do it. So I think that's where the, the difference comes in, in terms of standing as a candidate, as an independent candidate. Look, I could have stood as a uh, with a party, as I said before, but I wouldn't have, I would have still maintained the same thing, that if I wanted to say something, I will say it. How many councillors countrywide have come out or in the Durban area, Phoenix, and who stood out in the public and spoke out against the unrest in Phoenix? Not one. They do not have the testicular fortitude to stand up and speak because the party bosses will shut them up. And if they do not have that, then you're in trouble. The people are in trouble. So I yeah, say I to the people, do not vote for a person who is a party uh, lackey. Do it for a person you know has got the courage of his conviction or her conviction, who can stand up for the right, stand up for the people, fight the best he can. And even if he doesn't succeed, you know he fought the good fight. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Ganesh, <clears throat> you're obviously quite clued up. You're quite educated. People who are listening to you are getting very intrigued by the way you talk, the manner you talk, your knowledge. <clears throat> there's people like you, there's people like me, there's people like other people out there who have done work and whatever. Let's say, for example, and obviously they like to see you going places or doing things. Let's say, for example, you don't make it in this in this election. You don't get elected. Do we lose you as a, as, as a person going forward or do we galvanize like-minded people, thoughts that we can... And I, I brought this out today that people are always saying, why don't the Indians combine? Is it a utopian thing? Is it going to be impossible? I mean, I wouldn't want to see someone like you uh, lost to the cause or lost to it because you lost a, uh, you didn't become a ward councillor. How will you still then be able to effect change uh, or still work towards things, in the, uh, you know, in making things better for our people, for our country? Look, I don't have the ambition of having a villa in the, on the French Riviera or a super yacht in Monaco, you know, anchored nicely. Uh, I did mention that I stood for elections in 2016 and I lost. And all I ask you to do is look at my track history from then to now, immediately after the elections. I, it, it didn't bother me that I lost. I stood. I, I, I would have uh, espoused the same values that I'm espousing now. But I continued taking on the issues. Uh, you would have read in the media hundreds of my letters, taking on the president. There were so many times during COVID-19, you know, uh, I started my BSc, I've got a, 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 a qualified with a BSc degree in coronaviruses. So I have a very good idea of what happened when the coronavirus uh, uh, problem hit us. And I am from a science and medical background. And I used to uh, write letters to the president. There were so many times. There's one letter I wrote. I think I sent it to you as well. Be careful of the third, fourth, fourth fifth, and sixth waves. And the, uh, when the wave hit, we didn't take our time. When the coronavirus hit immediately, I was paying attention to it because it started in 2019 in Wuhan. I keep up to date with medical journals. And when that happened in March, I wrote a letter to the president to close the borders because what was happening in America at that time? In February, there were about uh, March, January, there were one or two cases, but it started exponentially increasing. And it was transported from Wuhan to uh, Europe and then to the States. Now, you've got to have that vision to, uh, to uh, uh, give advice. Not that I was an expert, but it would have helped to a certain extent. There wouldn't have been empty seats at dinner tables today if we acted differently. So, you know, in that respect, uh, I, I believe uh, that nothing will change. I will continue the good fight. I will take the body punches because it's a matter of conscience, isn't it? Uh, if you see wrong, they say uh, evil will prevail if good men do nothing. Good I do believe do I'm a good man. Exactly. Mr. Dan Gilesh, it's been wonderful. Um, you, you supported uh, my Park for the Posey movement in October last year. You were very supportive of that. What do you think of the Park for the Posey movement? 
I think it was worth the effort to show the uh, economic power that the so-called Indian community has. Although we, people saw it in a racial light, it was not about that. It, it made sense to tell South Africa, to tell the government, to tell the powers that be, look, do not marginalize the Indian community. They form a very integral part of our uh, of our society. They contribute to economics, medicine, education, agriculture, commerce. Do not marginalize them. Yet, triple B, double E, equity, uh, uh, employment equity, uh, quota systems are actually depleting this country of valuable resources, especially with the Indian communities who have got potential that is sitting at home, highly qualified. Oh, well, that might be a national and, issue. And, 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 if remember, that. and if you remember at that point, I was called the clown, the idiot, or whatever, because I was racially divided in the country. Indians were part of South Africa. Indians were supposed to be black. Indians were supposed to be part of the fabric. And come July 12th and the weeks after that, we found out clearly that we were not as black as we thought we were. We were not part of the fabric of South Africa. And we were thrown under the bus, which is what I was saying from the time in October, November last year, that we were marginalized, moved aside, set aside. And, and suddenly, the likes of the people are like Mr. Vizvan Reddy, who were so critical of us, started to sing the same song that we were singing in October, November, December last year. Yeah, look, I think, you know, I've always held this view that race is a myth, but racism is not. And South Africa is still a very polarized country. And the Indian community in the diaspora, in the, you know, in the world, <clears throat> are always targeted because of the ability to rise from the ashes, from rise from the phoenix, no pun intended. And uh, in South Africa in particular, more than any other country, because we outside India, we are amongst one of the largest populations of Indians, especially in Durban. So we've made sure we've contributed and, and progressed. We didn't burn schools. We built schools. I went to a state-aided Indian school in my formative years. So I place very great emphasis on education. I place great emphasis on the care of the young and the elderly. But in South Africa, the way the tapestry of our politics is going, it's all about power. Politics is about power, but the zest for it, the zeal, people are prepared to kill for it. That is uncivil. That is barbaric. And I will stand against it, even as a council, local government councillor. That might not be a local government issue, but I will not stop. And that's my advantage of being an independent, is I will take national issues on while being at local government, without the bother of a political boss telling me, don't uh, do that because we look bad. I will look bad. That's fine. I'll accept that. I think, I, I think as an independent, it gives you that that, that leeway. Uh, Mr. Ganesh, I'm going to end with this one. You're a, you are a brilliant writer. I always look forward to reading your comments. Many people have read your article that you sent out. Uh, obviously, um, a great writer. English, your forte. And I love reading that. I'm an English student as well. Um, however, uh, you wrote uh, the following. I'll quote, uh, not uh, this thing. And we had this little bit of power. So I thought I'll end with this. Yeah, nice one to end. Um, you wrote the following, a harbinger of local news and information at the forefront, keeping the community informed, fair, honest, and accurate reporting. Let me just reiterate that for the people who are listening on my platform. You write of this newspaper. I'm, I'm going to ask my guests now to guess which publication you are speaking of here today. When Mr. Ganesh says a harbinger, I'd actually Google what harbinger means, by the way. A harbinger of local news and information at the forefront, keeping the community informed, fair, honest, and accurate reporting has been its hallmark. Now, I'm just going to ask my guests, you don't comment. I'm going to ask my, guest, my, 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 my people on the program to please take a gander at which publication Mr. Narayan Ganesh is actually speaking of here. And uh, no prizes to be won here. We're just going to see if you can figure out which publication he, he wrote about here. Yeah. And uh, I was going to give him a hard time about this, but I'll let him off the hook here. Yeah. Uh, um, I thought we'll just end it on a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a fun note, if that may be the case. Uh, Salim is saying the post. Uh, Mike Harit Pasad is saying the post. Uh, there are only a few options to, to choose from, so maybe you can see. The words might give it away. I mean, fair, honest, and accurate reporting. Come on, guys. That is giving it away. I'm actually giving you the name of the publication. Come on, guys. Who is saying post? Uh, somebody's complimenting on your smile. Nice smile, Mr. Ganesh. 
Um, I'm going to. Uh, uh, <laughs> nobody's guessed accurately. Nobody is guessed correctly at the moment, Mr. Ganesh. Uh, they're all going to the post. Uh, Rashi said this was a long time ago. No, this was a two. This was about one month ago, actually, uh, that Mr. Naren Ganesh wrote this. I immediately picked up the phone and called Mr. Naren Ganesh because I know him and I had to express my view, which I did. Um, yeah, so by the way, ta -da, ta -da, we are going to reveal the name of that <laughs> publication. Mr. Ganesh, which publication were you referring to? Um, now you put me in a spot, didn't you? <laughs> okay, it was the Rising Sun. Uh, was it the uh, Overport edition or the Chatsworth edition, I think? Because they celebrated the 35th anniversary as a publication. Um, Mr. Kinnan, you scored, a, you scored a lot of points and then you just lost a lot of points. But anyways, somebody says the Daily Sun. Um, of course, I don't Surprising. agree with you on one level. I may, I may try to understand what you did. I'm not going to put you on the spot there and tackle you. But uh, I definitely don't agree with you on that one. Uh, the same newspaper called me public enemy number one. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I've, gotten, I've gotten over that. I've uh, moved on from that. And uh, I, just, I just thought, uh, instead of grilling you on it, I thought I'd have a bit of fun with you on it. And uh, end on that note. Not a problem. I'm up for fun. Yeah. So, I'm up yeah, for fun. Just, and um, I, didn't, I didn't, by the way, I phoned Mr. Ganesh immediately. I said to him, I'll do it. I don't agree with this comment here. But it's, it's his comment. is what he wanted to make to the rising sun. Uh, I, want to I, know I understand that. that's the truth and uh, you did call me immediately but that's the wonder of democracy where we can agree to disagree but not be disagreeable with each other Mr. Ganesh, thank you for being on the platform you have got a minute to close uh, you want to give a message out to the people here. we've had a good audience so far tonight they've been thoroughly engaged with your conversation and I think they appreciate it but just your parting shot before we close uh, look, uh, local government elections are very important uh, and you would have heard this a multitude number of times. When you vote, vote with your head, not with your heart. Because when you vote with your heart, the, the, the emotion that you want to express on that ballot paper will not uh, reflect the service that you might want to expect. So when you're looking at voting for a candidate, scrutinize that candidate, question that candidate, be satisfied that even if you are making a mistake, it's an educated mistake that you're making because the returns that you get in service delivery will truly depend on the person that you put out as your foot soldier to bring back that service into your community. And I'd like to wish everyone a good night. And for those who have lost one, uh, loved ones in their families during the COVID pandemic, while we're in the pandemic, my sympathies. And may God bless you. God bless your family and God bless South Africa. Thank you, Mr. Ganesh, and uh, that's where we end it tonight. A very lit discussion. We say good night to Mr. G Naren Ganesh. Thank you so much for joining us, and uh, hearty goodbye. There we have it, uh, Mr. Naren Ganesh. The uh, wonderful, wonderful, insightful um, conversation. There. Thank you for joining us. We've been almost uh, oh, almost two hours. We've been online, but it was a lit discussion. I'm sure most of you enjoyed what was happening. Uh, we learned a lot. We learned every day, every night. We learn a little bit more, a little bit more. Don't forget to learn more. Subscribe. Hit the subscribe button. Seventy nine ninety nine, not eighty rand, because I care about you guys. I don't want you guys spending eighty rand. Seventy nine ninety nine, just seventy nine ninety nine, justice for one cent. Come on, subscribe to the channel and uh, keep things going. Hit the subscribe button there, Kate Naidu, Robin Future, and why not? If you enjoy what I do and take the time out to uh, educate you guys and keep you informed, then you just hit the subscribe button and become a subscriber. I'll know tomorrow which of you have become subscribers. Uh, so says check the lineup on the page. Tomorrow we welcome Nicole Graham from the Democratic Alliance. That's also going to be quite lit. Uh, Wednesday, the EFF with us. Thursday, we have an attorney talking custody uh, father's rights on this program. Until then, tomorrow, the midday report. Remember, always keep it. Mother. The name is Casey Carr, as always. Love you and leave you. I'm out. <laughs>